welcome to another Anarchism Research Group video. Today we're talking to Martin Parker of University of Bristol about anarchism and critical management studies. Please hit subscribe, like and share this video. Hello, my name is Martin Parker. I'm Professor of Organisation Studies at the University of Bristol and lead for the Inclusive Economy Initiative. Um, which is a, uh, an attempt to get a group of people, group of academics from the University of Bristol, together with lots of organisations in the city, to tilt us towards a low carbon, high inclusion, high democracy economy. So I'm one of those slightly odd academics who's associated with something called critical management studies, a kind of fringe movement in business schools around the Atlantic, and increasingly globally, I guess. Um, of people who are quite critical of the ways in which established forms of business um, teaching and research are conducted. So critical management studies in some senses takes a whole set of theories from things like Frankfurt School critical theory and various forms of Marxism, different kinds of post-structuralism, um, aspects of feminism and post-colonialism and so on. So a fairly uh, you know, predictable set of, of, of kind of critical positions, if you like, and then applies those to um, teaching and research within, uh, within the management and business disciplines, which might sound rather counterintuitive in a sense, because I think for lots of people, business schools are you know, the epitome of a certain kind of neoliberal conservatism. But effectively, what's happened over the last 20 years or so is that they've developed their kind of their internal critique, if you like. So a whole bunch of people like me who are busily biting the hand that feeds them. So one of the ways in which I've been involved in the kind of critical management studies um, moment is through a series of, of attempts to kind of th to think about how we might reimagine what business schools do um, in terms of teaching and research, but also the sort of uh, political commitments that they might espouse. Um, I, I guess that probably the best summary of this is in a, in, in a book I published um, a couple of years ago now, uh, Shut Down the Business School, with Pluto in 2018, which is an attempt to think about what's wrong with the business school and what we should do about it. Essentially, to very quickly summarise the argument there, I suggest business schools are basically ways of teaching capitalism, um, and it's uh, it's better to be you know fairly blunt about that. Uh, and they reproduce assumptions about a pro-growth economy, about um, a certain kind of necessary hierarchical form of organisation where people are called managers lead uh, the managed, um, and in which the corporation is imagined to be the default form of organising, the most effective form. And in the book, what I try to do is suggest that we should instead be producing something I, I call the school for organising, which is a way of thinking about organising as a much more generalised term, rather than assuming that uh, management is the one best way. So organising necessarily implies a kind of an experimental approach to the, the challenges that face us and recognises the wide, extremely diverse variety of ways in which human beings have come together with each other and with material technologies over time and over space in order to solve their problems. This raises some quite interesting questions, I think, in terms of the way in which we might imagine an ethics or a politics for uh, the business school or the school for organising. Many uh, people would like to imagine that the university is a politically neutral space and that um, forms of knowledge production, you know, as in the natural sciences, are, um, are, are, are somehow innocent of, um, of a kind of um, a political bias or a certain kind of ethical position or something like that. And though we might, you know, for a variety of reasons, say that that's at least partly true in terms of natural scientific methods, at least, Within the social sciences, I think those kinds of defences are simply impossible. And this is particularly the case, I think, when it comes to the question of the business school. The business school over the last 150 years or so has essentially been an institution which has grown mostly within uh, large, the large universities of the global north in order to educate the powerful about how to produce an economy that benefits the powerful. 
So the you know the, the political bias is very clear in most of this stuff. This is about how we produce forms of organisation that um, essentially scrape as much surplus from people and planet in order to concentrate it in an increasingly limited number of hands. And that's regarded to be somehow a politics which is kind of invisible, in a sense, that isn't commented on. So it's curious then, in a, in a way, that people might suggest that, that I'm introducing politics into the business school somehow. Uh, because to me, it's a necessary corrective. You know, it's, it's a kind of question of thinking about what forms of organisation, what forms of economy are going to produce a society, a, a, a social order, which is more desirable than the one that we have at present. In terms of the distributions of income and wealth or the emissions of carbon um, or people's sense of efficacy of their own um, decision making about their economic and social relations and so on. So then the interesting question to me is, how do we engineer forms of education within the business school or the, or the school for organising, whatever, that are aimed in that sort of direction? And the simplest way of illustrating this is really to think about climate change. And anybody who is teaching forms of capitalism or finance or accounting or marketing or something that rely on the idea of uh, there being no natural limits uh, or that uh, somehow there's going to be a magic technological save to the problem of uh, uh, of climate change uh, would, would would simply be seen to be irresponsible. So that's essentially what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to introduce a sort of politics into business school education that recognises that, that the business, business schools have a responsibility to be producing um, a politics and organisation, um, a form of economy that is better in objective terms than the one that we have at present. That's a pressing question, isn't it? It's a pressing question for the West. Because actually most people in the world don't live the lives we have. I'm interested in anarchism in part because it seems that over the last 200 years it's been the most concentrated form of inquiry into organisation which has begun with a kind of scepticism about many of the conventional terms that we might use. So if we take, for example, something, you know, something like leadership, leadership is very commonly taught within uh, schools of business and management. Um, uh, and, you know, the whole set of different theories about what makes good leaders and some quite interesting ones like sort of uh, more transactional or distributed versions of leadership and all the rest of it. But most of the time, they don't really question the idea that we need leaders. It's almost as if there is a kind of um, a necessary hierarchical relation assumed within the construction of anything called an organisation. So the idea of leaderless organisations or of organisations with rotating leaders or organisations in which every member might um, make decisions about the different forms of um, of steering of guidance that the organization requires a, a kind of ruled out of court yeah and for anarchists this is this makes no sense because in a sense anarchism is a kind of organization without guarantees right you know we know that anarchists are profoundly concerned with questions of organization and they're so concerned with it they don't make concrete assumptions about the way it, in which organizing must happen now, historically, of course, much of this has involved the assertion of more local and proximate forms of organisation against the forms of organisation represented by the state or by the capitalist or whatever it might be. So very often it's about a particular kind of um, almost a sort of localism, a more a, a kind of a smaller form of organisation against larger forms. But I don't think that's necessarily the case because there's plenty of arguments there in terms of ideas about federalism and so on and the way in which smaller groups of people could give, give consent to larger representative bodies and all the rest of it. The point is that anarchism has discussed these as open questions. Most of the um, literature within the business school on management, on leadership, on uh, group membership and so on assumes hierarchy. It assumes managerialism. It assumes capitalism. Yeah. And doesn't doesn't open these questions up. Now, that's a kind of an odd thing for a university to be doing, isn't it? Because university researchers are supposed to be people in a sense who are interrogating, profoundly interrogating the questions that face them. But it seems that in many parts of the business school, 
assumptions are made without being interrogated. In other words, people assume that they know what the best form of market is or the best form of organisation or the, the character of individuals, whatever it might be. And those kinds of assumptions are then used to construct a sort of um, a sort of naturalism, a naturalism, I suppose, about business as usual. And that, it seems to me, particularly at the present moment when we're facing the challenges of, uh, of climate change, a profoundly dangerous position to be in. I guess one of the dangers of thinking about anarchism as a potential resource for the business school, a way of introducing new thinking and so on, is that it might well become co-opted. It might become uh, not so much resource as, as, as sort of nutrition. Um, in order to um, help the business school produce different kinds of business models. And of course, there's a long history about this kind of stuff, isn't there? The ways in which a whole variety of, say, countercultural movements from the 1960s and 1970s are now repackaged as business practices so that, you know, somebody like Richard Branson can talk about themselves as an anarchist or something like that. This sort of idea that entrepreneurs are business disruptors and, and the kind of the the cloak of the pirate flag is, you know, sometimes used in order to add a kind of pattern of radicalism. And indeed, it's probably important to recognise that any idea runs the danger or the likelihood of being co-opted. But I'm not sure that means that that we should simply try and keep some kind of hygienic separation between something like anarchism or any radical ideas, you know, feminist or, uh, um, or, or, or deep green environmentalism, whatever, and the business school, because the business school is too important to ignore. There are something like 13,000 business schools globally, at least 13,000, and 99% of them, 99% of the time, are reproducing a set of really dangerous ideas about hierarchy, about growth, about the dominance of the corporation and so on. So if those can be moderated somewhat, even if there is a danger of incorporation, it seems to me that that's a desirable thing. What I'm more interested in, of course, is how we might, to use the cliche, bake some of ide those ideas into the ownership and control structures of the organisation itself. It's easy enough to decorate your organisation with notions of empowerment. It's harder to think about, say, a cooperative ownership and decision making structure. But really, that should be the direction, I think, in which we are encouraging organisations to move, um, largely because it then becomes much harder to to simply co-opt ideas about decision making because they're embedded into the way that the organisation has to operate. You know, plenty of examples of, co of worker co-ops, for example, in which uh, it is effectively impossible for um, any one form of um, one, one cadre of managerialists to gain complete control because of the distribution of ownership, yeah, or because of the kind of the the, the radical histories of the organisation or whatever it might be. So, though I can see the dangers of co-optation, I don't necessarily think they always are a bad thing. And I would encourage anybody who 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 wants to kind of keep an, uh, keep anarchism and other ideas sanitised, that that also means that they'll be relatively. Um, uh, well, they won't have a great deal of influence. When you start to think about the kind of the details of anarchist ideas, um, then of course you can see a dizzying variety of ways in which both classical and contemporary anarchisms can be applied to organisational contexts. So whether we're talking about forms of state level governance and federalism and say the relationship between larger institutions and smaller institutions, or whether we're talking about more bottom up notions of what it means to be engaged in organizing practices with particular people. The general message seems to be to me and you know, some very libertarian anarchists would probably disagree with this is that what anarchism encourages us to do is to think about the balance between certain forms of constraint and certain forms of freedom. Yeah. I don't think that, um, again, you know, accepting extreme libertarian positions, that the mainstream of anarchism really um, is, is predicated on the idea that we can all be free to do anything. I think it essentially encourages us to be reflective about what sorts of constraints we might accept in order that we um, have other sorts of freedoms. So if we think about that in the context of the work organisation, we can get some really interesting ideas moving. Obviously, work organisations are going to require that um, you know, whatever you're doing, I mean, you know, we we're talking about, so let, let, let's, let's, let's pick kind of a stereotypical anarchist 
vegetarian cafe or something like that. Not all the work is going to be lovely all of the time. And you're going to need some kind of rotor that makes sure that, you know, the bins get emptied and that somebody peels the potatoes or whatever, yeah, that, that some of that stuff happens. That's probably going to require thinking about the rotation of jobs, which is something that's been extensively discussed within um, management and organisation theory in the 50s and 60s. It's probably going to require thinking about the allocations of time to different kinds of jobs. Um, in terms of a, an analysis of how much time particular sorts of things take and so on. It's probably also going to involve some sort of analysis of the amount of, of value that's being produced for the organisation because, you know, the my imaginary uh, anarchist vegetarian calf still needs to pay its bills and, you know, assuming some sort of wage economy for now, then it's going to need to pay its workers too. So it is going to have to have um, a set of ways in which it makes its um, financial, spatial and temporal decisions visible to everybody in the organisation. So very recently there was a book published by, Ra by Routledge called Anarchist Accounting by uh, a Swedish um, uh, academic called uh, Anna Sandström. Um, and in that book, Anna basically argues that even anarchist organisations need to be you know, need to have accounts. But the purpose of those accounts isn't simply about capital accumulation. The purposes of those accounts is to make the organisation visible to everybody who's participating in it. So you get a kind of radical twist on that stuff then, don't you? You know, the, the idea of the accountant as a kind of a dull bean counter who's basically making sure that some people get lots and other people don't get very much at all, becomes instead a, a purveyor of trusted information about the way that the organisation operates. So yeah, I think there's an enormous amount of 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 of, of learning that um, both anarchists can um, can do about management, but also managers, uh, people in in management and business schools can learn about the potentials of organising by thinking about anarchist theory. Yeah, it's a sort of the giving up argument. You know, what you have to sacrifice in order to to live a. Lots of people might assume that business schools um, would tend to be rather hostile environments for someone who was interested in anarchism. Um, and to a certain extent, that's true. But but we, we need to qualify that a bit in that there are, you know, clusters of people who are interested in this kind of stuff in particular places. Um, and if we're talking about the UK, the context in which I'm working, then over the last sort of 20 or 30 years, there have been little sort of eruptions of critical people. This book, um, Anarchism, Organisation and Management, uh, which is really the kind of the excuse for this interview, um, was published when the three editors were all working at Leicester University, which had a, a particularly interesting uh, school of management at the time. Uh, in which quite a lot of us were talking about critical management studies and about a whole variety of different forms of critical theory, including, of course, anarchist theory. What I'm kind of seeing now, particularly at the present moment, is that I think there is more of a sense of exhaustion, both within and outside the business school, at the idea of business as usual. And really, COVID has accelerated this, I think, that many of the ways in which people who are committed to relatively conventional versions of organisation and economy have seen these kind of gigantic transformations in the way that the state has thought about its uh, its magic money trees or the way in which we've imagined what work uh, and workplaces might be um, or discovering who the really essential key workers in the country are and so on. So it does seem to me at the moment that there's an enormous amount of interest in the idea of new business models. And particularly if we add to this ideas about, say, the Green New Deal and Build Back Better and No Going Back and all the kind of Extinction Rebellion stuff and so on, that the, the field is wide open for anarchist ideas and others, you know, socialist, green, feminist and so on, to enter and begin to reconstitute the idea of what we imagine a successful business organisation might be. I don't think we can do without businesses. You know, we're going to have organisations that make us bread, that provide us with mobile telephones, that 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 that, that give us the, um, the 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 things that we want to eat and wear, and the places that we're going. You know, go and have get you know get drunk with people and all the rest of it. You know, businesses are going to be providing that stuff for us. So the question is not being hostile towards business as such. It's about what kinds of businesses and what forms of ownership, control and decision making are going to constitute those businesses in the future.
So this is really where anarchism, I think, becomes relevant. And what we were hoping to do in this book is to provide something that effectively can be used as a student textbook, but that questions the common sense of um, the orthodox text. So when somebody says, you know, all organisations have to have leaders, then this is this book's got a chapter saying, well, no, they don't. And there's lots of different ways in which you might think about this. I think that for many of the students, you know, something like one in seven students in the UK are now studying some variant of business management accounting. For many of those students, they understand that there is a severe problem with carbon rich neoliberalism. What they don't understand is what to do about it. And hopefully anarchism can provide some of the intellectual inspiration for people to think about how they do things differently. A lot of anarchist writing has sort of existed in a kind of insulated space in which we could imagine particular forms of organisation, you know, which sound highly desirable, in which leadership is distributed and we have, you know, long meetings and and, and, and discuss um, our, our strategies and all the rest of it. But, but in, in these particular spaces of organising, without thinking hard about what sorts of policies at a wider level and what sort of economy at a wider level might be produced by the generalization of these kinds of forms. So that if I said, you know, I started off by saying something like the business school is responsible for reproducing capitalism, okay? The next bit of that then is to ask, okay, so what forms of organization and economy do we want my school for organizing to be producing? And the question isn't just about decisions within organizations. It's also a question about, for example, you know, do we have some kind of state functions which mandate, um, for example, the use of electric vehicles? Just what the relationship between those central forms of authority and any kind of regional or local forms of decision making might be is a really interesting and important question. But I suspect it's one that anarchists have rather shied away from because they've often stayed at this relatively proximate level, at the kind of the, the local levels of decision making and organisation around, you know, the co-op or the social centre or whatever it might be. And those are, I'm not saying those aren't important questions, but they're important questions which are embedded in bigger important questions. And I think that's what an understanding of the business school might bring to anarchism that we need to think about an anarchist economy rather than simply questions of anarchist organisation. Buying and disposing and buying and disposing. Buying and disposing and buying and disposing.